The word opera comes from the Italian phrase opera in musica, which means work in music. It stands for a theatrical work which is made of a dramatic text, also known as a libretto, which has been set to music and evolves a stage that requires beautiful sceneries, flamboyant costumes, and solo as well as choral singers on the stage, who are backed by a group of instrumentalists who play offstage. It has attracted many supporters, and at the same time opera is known to have been criticized by many people because of the costs it involves. It is considered to be an expensive form of music, which requires many people starting from the writing of the story to the enactment of the opera involving the music, singers, and the dance. The producer has to ensure that everything falls in place perfectly, and practice on the opera can vary from a few days to months, depending on the complexities of the opera that will be performed. In the course of history, Opera has continuously shifted the balance that it strikes between poetry and music. What began as a seamless blending of the two, where the performers achieved a language which was between singing and speaking, gradually moved toward the favor of music and the text became less pronounced. Some historical reforms in opera tried to reinforce the balance between the two, but the manner in which opera and its creators continuously innovate to come up with performances that try to fulfill the tastes of the audiences and the changing attitudes of the patrons. At the same time, opera has also adapted to the different national preferences of the countries around the world, surviving over 400 years in the Western culture. Opera was born during the Renaissance period in Italy. It was primarily a mode of royal entertainment for the kings and queens of the 16th century. Elaborate presentations were made to celebrate royal events which allowed the kings and the nobility to brag about their wealth to the royal people, as well as the foreign dignitaries. Using flamboyant costumes and spectacular effects, opera became a favorite means of alluring people to enjoy the time they spent celebrating an event. Most of the themes around which the opera was created were taken from classical mythology of the Greeks and Romans. When opera was introduced to the people, its purpose was mainly to impress the audience and to ensure that a positive image of the emperor and its people was portrayed before those who came to the royal court. What started as a form of Roman revival became opera over the next two centuries. In the 16th century, when the Renaissance period was at its peak, many Italian courts began the performance of Roman plays on festive occasions. But Roman plays could turn rather intense and the audience was accustomed to something more light-hearted. This gave way to lavish musical entertainments, which came to be known as intermezzi, which stands for intermediate pieces. The intermezzi was acted between plays to lighten the mood and augment the spirits of the viewers with splendid effects, extravagant costumes, and a lot of singing and dancing. The audience began looking forward to these intermezzi, which seemed to be a lot more exciting than the actual plays. One of the most popular intimacy, which has been preserved in spectacular detail, was performed at the lavish wedding at the Medici court, Florence, in the year 1589. The scenes of the intermezzi became the foundation of modern-day opera, with clouds floating across the stage, and delightful gardens, and a rocky mountain with a mermaid sitting on it. This was every bit the kind of entertainment the nobility at Florence needed. This started gaining momentum in Florence, and the artists began to innovate as they discovered a new form of music, which soon came to be known as opera. The transition from intermezzi to opera was not quick. It took a considerable amount of time, as musicians and artists dabbled in music, trying to bring the best for their audience, and ensuring that their work was entertaining enough. The soul of opera lies in the music, but it takes a beautiful form through the visuals that are used. These visuals played an equally important role to stimulate the senses of the audience so that they enjoyed the piece of music along with the sights they saw and the experience they had. While opera continues to have its soul embedded deep in the music even today, it is one of those forms of music which has never stopped low when it came to visuals. Charming dresses, enticing backgrounds, and heavenly scenes have always been a part of opera. The fact is, that opera has maintained its originality in a lot of ways, and that continues to keep opera a classy affair, which is usually enjoyed by people of a higher class and taste. 
Opera continues to be a form of music which is enjoyed by the elite class more than anyone else. The Beginning of Opera and the Baroque Period Opera began with Daphne by Jacopo Peri, which was a musical play and was meant to revive classical Greek drama. With Renaissance being the driving force for many artists during the period, the revival of Greek drama led to opera because it was believed that the chorus of the play was originally sung, and even entire texts may have been delivered in the form of songs. Daphne relates the story of Daphne, who took the form of a laurel so that she could escape the attention of Apollo. The entire enactment is full of drama, music, and songs. Sadly, Daphne is lost, and we have no means to find out the details of this opera, which is considered by many to be the first opera created in the world. Perry did write a second one, known as Eurydice, in 1600, which has survived. Eurydice was performed at Pitti Palace, Florence, as a means of entertainment on the occasion of the marriage of Maria de' Medici, along with Henry IV of France. When Eurydice is considered to be the earliest opera that has survived, it is Claudio Monteverdi's Orfeo, which has gained a lot of popularity in the world of opera, and is considered to be very popular even today. The plot is beautiful, and the enactment is splendid. With Orfeo becoming a favorite quickly, Claudio soon became famous in the region. It is said that Orfeo was Claudio's first attempt at opera. This opera was first presented at the court of Mantua in 1607, before the Lent began. At that time, opera was fairly new to the world, about ten years old, and its freshness made it welcome, and the visual effects added to the beauty of the music. Though Orfeo, the story of Orpheus's love for Eurydice is displayed, and how he goes to the extent where he is willing to descend to the underworld to bring back the love of his life. Orpheus's parts were sung by a castrato. Today, Orfeo remains a favorite for many opera players, and it continues to be played on the stage every now and then. The astounding effect it has on the viewers makes opera singers choose it for the stage time and again. After the death of the Duke of Mantua, Monteverdi became Master of Music for the Venetian Republic. As Master of Music, Monteverdi primarily composed sacred music, which was used in the recitals and performances at St. Mark's. His popularity in Europe is mainly owed to these compositions, which quickly spread through the continent. The citizens of Venice found no reason to restrict the beautiful music performances to the aristocratic classes only. This led to the opening of the first public opera house in Venice in the year 1637. It was named Teatro San Cassiano. Monteverdi had turned 70 by this time, but his love for music, especially opera, had never died. With an opera house in the city, he began working on new opera pieces. The two that survive from this period are considered as masterpieces in the form till this day. The first one is named Il Ritorno di Liusse in Patria, which means the return of Ulysses to his country. This piece was premiered in Teatro San Cassiano in the year 1641. By this time, a second public opera house made its appearance in the city. It was grander than the first one, and it was named Teatro Santi Giovanni e Paolo. In this opera house, Monteverdi's second piece, known as L'Incoriazone di Popia, was premiered in 1642. Monteverdi is known to have turned the manner in which people listened to vocal music. Certain accounts mention that people even cried at some of the operatic performance which were created by him. Venice is considered to be the place from where opera's fame spread to the world. The people of Venice considered it to be a great form of music, and opera was brought to public notice by the many opera houses in Venice. It is known that Venice had seven opera houses in the 17th century, a time when opera was at its most nascent stages and required a platform to launch itself. One of Monteverdi's pupils, Francesco Cavalli, gained a lot of popularity as an opera composer during his era. He created over two dozen operas between 1639 and 1669, and his compositions became famous in the Venetian opera houses. One of his most renowned works, in Glacione, which translates to Jason, which was composed in 1649. Cavalli's most notable competitor was Pietro Antonia Sesti, who also composed over a dozen operas, out of which Orontia, 
1656, is the most popular one. The Baroque period lasted from 1600 to 1750. During this period, many other composers began to rise once opera gained popularity. Other composers who are known for their compositions are Antonio Sartorio, Giovanni Lagrenzi, and Antonio Vivaldi, who was popular in the early 18th century. Vivaldi has 49 compositions to his credit, but most of his work is lost. One opera was popular enough, and many composers began creating operas. The publications of opera ceased, and the patronage extended by the aristocracy ceased to exist. Most of the opera lasted for just one season, and they were quickly replaced with new operas created by composers. These operas were short-lived, and this is why most of them have been lost. Recover and revival of these opera work gained pace in the late 20th century, and some of the operas, especially the works of Cavalli, were found at this time. The Venetian operas became an extravagant affair where the composers focused more on the solo arias and the duets than the choral singers. This was contrary to the Florentine opera style. In addition to this, the number of arias increased from 24 to 60, and the Venetian opera gained its own distinctive persona as opera developed in the Baroque period. Other Italian cities quickly took to opera too, especially Rome, where there were many wealthy patrons who were willing to sponsor the composers. Some of the most popular Roman composers were Stefano Landi, Domenico Mazziocchi, and Luigi Rossi. The Roman composers were strongly influenced by the Florentine opera styles, but they gradually diverged from the style as they experimented with the arias and recitatifs, striving to strike a better balance. Like the Venetians, the Romans added comic acts to tragedies to lighten the opera. They chose to make the recitatifs less musical and more speech-like. The Romans did not allow women to sing on the stage, so female roles were taken up by the castrati. Opera was also popular in Naples, where the first opera house of the city, Teatro San Bartolomeo, came up in the mid-17th century. By 1700, Naples had become Venice's competitor in opera compositions. Most of the opera compositions in Naples was popular because of Alessandro Scarlatti, who wrote 66 operas, out of which 32 were for Teatro San Bartolomeo. His works flourished between 1684 and 1702. The War of the Spanish Succession made him leave Naples and return to Rome. His best work is La Cadua de Decembeviri, which means The Fall of the Decembevirs. Scarlatti continued to compose operas for Rome, Naples, and Florence before his return to Naples in the year 1709. However, by this time, his style was fading as budding composers rendered refreshing changes to opera styles. By 1730, Italian opera started gaining popularity in over 130 cities and towns across Europe. Opera was brought to France as early as 1650, but it was not able to establish a stronghold in the country because of the dominance of ballet performances in France. People preferred ballet and spoken drama over opera during the period. In 1671, Pomone by Robert Cambert is known to be the first French opera which led to the inauguration of the Académie Royale de Musique, which is now known as the Paris Opera. Most of Pomone is lost, and only the overture, prologue, first act, and part of the second act are available today. Under the royal patronage of Louis XIV, Jean-Baptiste Lully changed opera through his compositions. He was able to exercise monopoly when it came to the production of sung drama in France from the year 1672. Till his death in 1687, Lully's work pervaded the country's music tastes. His elaborate creations, along with the literary geniuses who collaborated with him, ensured that Lully's popularity did not decline until the time he was alive. Just like ballet made it difficult for opera to make its presence felt in France, Mask portrayed a problem for opera in England. Another thing that inhibited the popularity of opera in England was the financial weak state of the monarchs who were caught in civil wars in the mid-17th century. Henry Purcell is known to have created one of the most lasting impressions in English opera through his compositions, but there were no successors to his work, and the development of a fully sung opera in England 
did not happen until the late 19th century. Opera was able to get recognition to a certain extent with the arrival of German composer George Frederick Handel in 1710. His company obstinately dedicated themselves to opera, giving the form a better direction in the country. Some of his popular works are Giulio Cesare, Rotelinda, and Orlando. Handel assembled some of the most famous sopranos and castrati in his company so that he can create a sensation among the audiences. But tastes were changing, and people began to move away from his style of opera, which created an economic problem for Handel. The composer took to the creation of oratorios, which were set to biblical texts in English. These were found to be appealing for the Protestants, and opera soon became a thing of the past for Handel. His works were later revived in 1920s, and toward the end of the 20th century, these compositions became the most popular ones in English opera. In Germany, opera was introduced by the Italian composers who resided in the country. Abbe Agostino Stefani was a Venetian who helped in spreading word about the opera in Munich, Hanover, and other places in Germany. Starting with the production of Marco Aurelio, Stefani composed operas for 28 years. He fused different styles, which included both French and Italian styles, to come up with a style of his own which was later used by many other composers who composed opera away from their home country. It was a sort of international Italian style, which became so popular in Germany that even the German composers were influenced by the Italian style, and they also used Italian texts. Johann Theile, a pupil of Schutz, is accredited with the creation of some of the early operas like Adam und Eva, which inaugurated the first public opera house in Hamburg, Germany. Reinhard Kaiser created some of the most notable operas in the early 18th century for the opera house in Hamburg. His complete work consists of over 60 operas, out of which a meager 19 operas have survived. He was a great influence for George Frederick Handel, who worked in Hamburg for a brief period of time before going to Italy and then to London. Reformations Leading to the Grand Opera The Baroque period ended in 1750, by when opera was an established form of music, and it had many supporters across Europe. However, the different styles in which opera was being popularized gave rise to a polemic war which was a showdown between opera Syria and opera buffa, in layman terms, the styles which existed between French and Italian opera was the cause of the rivalry which seemed to have reached national sentiments. At a time like this, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a leader of the Italian faction, staged a single-act comic opera, Le Divin du Village, which translates into The Village Soothsayer. It was staged in Fontainebleau, France, and it blended both French and Italian styles to perfection which helped in pleasing people in both the countries. Rousseau's work influenced many composers who wanted to achieve the same effect that Rousseau had on the public. One of the most popular composers who followed into Rousseau's footsteps were François-André Danican, who was known as Philidor. He was also a splendid chess player. He wrote 20 opera comiques. Belgian composer André Gritti was also one of the finest opera composers of the period he was able to strike a perfect equilibrium between the two styles. He composed operas for almost 30 years, which was during the period of the French Revolution. In Paris, Etienne Nicolas Mehul was taking the opera audience by storm with his flexible forms of opera, which included a variety of operas that encapsulated different sentiments, starting from light-hearted comedy to romance to chivalry. Mehul was able to influence many composers of the Romantic period, which started in the 19th century. This reform began with a level of dissatisfaction arising among people who did not find the dominance of opera Syria to be very delightful. So gradually, a movement toward a genre which somewhat resembled Rousseau's efforts began to be noticed. Thomas Treta and Niccolo Giomelli are two composers who began using a technique which is referred to as recitativo accompanato, which means the recitatives are accompanied by the orchestra. They also promoted the use of ensembles and choruses, which had diminished in purpose in opera Syria. Christoph Willebach Gluck is known to be one of the most historically recognized figures who is associated 
with the 18th century opera form. He had a lot of composers who claimed that they were his legitimate successors, and some very important opera composers were influenced by his works and used his compositions for inspiration. Gluck's compositions were a synthesis of the French and Italian styles of opera. Gluck had greatly inspired Mehul and Mozart, and Italian composers who were inspired by him include Antonio Salieri, who is known to have imparted lessons to Ludwig van Beethoven. Other Italian composers influenced by Gluck were Niccolo Piccini and Antonio Sacchini. While most of Gluck's operatic compositions were the usual librettos influenced by Metatasio, he gradually began absorbing the French opera styles during his stay in Vienna in 1750. With the help of Conte Giacomo Durazzo, who was the superintendent of the Imperial Vienna Theatre, Gluck was able to absorb the example of Jean-Georges Novaire, who was considered to be one of the most popular French dancer choreographers of the time. Novaire wanted ballet to be more than just a collection of episodes which did not bear connection to each other. Durazzo also began an anti-meditation movement, which attracted the poet Ranieri Calzabigi, who later wrote three librettos for Gluck. Calzabigi is also known for drawing up the renowned dedication of the publication of Alceste in 1769. This dedication played a pivotal role in the operatic reform. According to it, the true office of music was to serve poetry, which was being mired by the manner in which the florid da capo areas were being written. Gluck tried to restore opera to its true function, which was drama set to music. These ideals are seen primarily in the opera Orfeo and Eurydice, Alceste and Paradis, and Elena. While these were Italian operas which were staged in Vienna, Gluck reconstituted the first two operas to French librettos for the operatic audiences in Paris, making the two operas statelier and resonating an influence of Rameau in the compositions. In Vienna, the Italian opera Buffa was a strong influence and many Austrian composers were also inspired by it. A notable composer of comic opera in the 18th century was Karl Ditters von Dittesdorf. One of his most popular works was Doctor und Apotheker in 1786, which translates into Doctor and Apothecary. But his work was eclipsed by the compositions of Mozart, for whom Vienna proved to be an important center. He became one of the most renowned masters of opera, which was considered to be one of the most prestigious forms of music of his time. Mozart had started writing music at the early age of 10, and by the age of 25 he had composed his first opera, Idomeneo, in 1781 in Munich. His first work reflected the combination of opera Syria and Gluck's inspirations, along with tragedy lyrique. Today, Idomeneo is seen as one of the most popular examples of opera Syria composed during the late 18th century. A year after Idomeneo, Mozart composed an enchanting singspiel, which won over the hearts of his Viennese audience and helped him establish his reputation in Vienna. The name of the opera is Die Entfurungausdem Serial, 1782, which translates into the Abduction from the Seraglio. The style of music, the depth of the sentiments that fills this opera, and the beauty of the story had everyone awestruck. It also includes a soprano aria, which is considered to be one of the most difficult sopranos till this day. Mozart's works continued to gain popularity, and his next work, Le Nose di Figaro, 1786, which means The Marriage of Figaro, is a notable piece of work for the elaborate music and the fast-paced ensemble finales, which helps in adding a certain amount of thrill to the comic situations. The opera tells the story of Figaro, who is a character created by Pierre de Beaumarchais. Figaro is considered to be a crafty servant who cunningly outwits his master, who is an aristocrat, in the game of love. His next opera was commissioned by an impresario. It was for the National Theatre in Prague. Mozart's Don Giovanni was based on previous works of Don Juan librettos and plays by other writers. Today, Don Giovanni is one of the most highly regarded operas. The elements of music that define this opera were noticed as the predecessors of operatic romanticism, and the protagonist of the opera was considered to be a model of the romantic hero. Mozart had collaborated with De Ponte, 
to create the Opera Syria for Don Giovanni, and the results were simply outstanding. For a last time, the two worked together on an opera buffa, Cosi Fantuti, 1790. It translates into All Women Are Like That, and it is considered to be another masterpiece, which has great lyrics and an awesome melodious score. Mozart's last work for the stage was Die Zauberflatter, 1791, which translates to The Magic Flute. The librettos are by Emmanuel Schikander, and the music created by Mozart is beautiful. It adds a lot of meaning to the different characters in the opera, and gives the opera a great sense. Audiences have enjoyed listening to such beautiful opera productions even till this day. Beethoven's Fidelio, 1805, which was revised in 1806, and then 1814, is another example of an awesome composition which was a lot more than a singspiel, and had a lot of meaningfulness in the beauty of the music created. Fidelio has a grandeur to it, which comes through its music and the splendid story about Lenore who is disguised in the form of Fidelio so that she can rescue her husband from incarceration. The theme along with the music that accompanies it is admirable and it has ensured Fidelio an important place in the history of opera. In Italy during the first half of the 19th century, some popular composers were Simon Mayer, Giacomo Rossini, Gaetano Donetzi, and Bellini. All of them had different styles, but they all played their part in inculcating the love of opera among the audiences in Italy where opera was born. Their varied styles and the numerous compositions made them popular and they had some masterworks to their credit, too, which are considered great till the present day. Grand Opera and Contemporary Works In Paris, the 19th century introduced the Grand Opera, which was an international form of opera. It involved the use of historical or pseudo-historical librettos, along with scenic backgrounds, gorgeous costumes, ballets, many supernumeraries, the Grand Opera was very similar to a Hollywood movie, with all elements of a blockbuster film. The Grand Opera had somehow found its roots in the original Venetian operas, which were meant for the royal courts. They involved a lot of flamboyance, and had a huge amount of money spent on the backgrounds and the costumes. It also seemed to have been influenced by the stately scores of revered opera composers like Rameau and Gluck. While the beginning of this trend was in Paris, the opera writers who began this were Italian expats. The two Italian expats were Luigi Cherubini and Gaspare Spottini. While they may be known for starting the Grand Opera, the person who was seen as the leader of the Grand Opera in Paris was a German composer by the name of Giacomo Meyerbeer. Meyerbeer's work, Robert le Diable, 1831, which means Robert the Devil, became a huge success and by the year 1893 it had already been sung 751 times at the Paris Opera. The main author of this worked for many other composers, writing librettos for many of them at the same time. Meyerbeer's success in the Grand Opera led to other composers copying his style. La Juive, 1835, by Fromenthal Halevy, is known to be a close copy of his style, and could almost be mistaken for Meyerbeer's work. With grand opera gaining success, composers quickly began to copy the styles and variations started cropping up, with more composers trying to sway the audiences to win their hearts through their unique compositions of music. The grand opera had become one of the most effective styles in the early 19th century for the composers in France. While most of the composers were expatriates, the music that was being created in France was outstanding and the people began to appreciate opera even more as they began to enjoy the grandeur of this form of music. Beautiful voices, elegant costumes, and admirable music blended perfectly into each other, forming an art which was more than a simple means of entertainment. It was a joy to behold such operatic performances, and the composers took motivation in the fulfillment of such joys. Romanticism started in Germany with three operas, which were created between the years 1821 and 1826. These works were composed by Karl Maria von Weber. The first one was Der Freischutz, 1821, 
which established the Romantic era where the writers enjoyed creating works which were around the themes of dark forests, hunting horns, supernatural forces, and love. The popularity of Romanticism was overwhelming in Germany, and in all other countries, too. The two other operas, Euranthe and Oberon, were not as successful as the first one, but they helped in furthering the Romantic operas in Germany. Romantic opera dominated the stages for a notable period of time, and it stayed until the First World War. While there are many composers who played their part in the Romantic period, some of the most notable opera composers of the time were Giuseppe Verde, Richard Wagner, and Giacomo Puccini. This was roughly the time when Russia also came up with notable opera composers like Mikhail Glinka, Modest Mussorgsky, and Peter Tchaikovsky. Verdi was 26 when he had composed his first opera, Oberto, Conte di San Bonifacio, 1839 in Milan. He wrote 26 operas in his lifetime, with the last one written in the year 1893 when Verdi was 80. His dominion over Italian music lasted for most of the second half of the 19th century. Verdi's works are considered to be some of the most frequently performed operas till today. His operas bore loyalty to the traditions of Italian opera, which made him a national hero. Wagner, on the other hand, found opera to be a form of human drama, which was focused on voice. He wrote the music and the librettos for his works, and he gave instructions for setting up the stage and the scenic design, too. He started his operatic career with Das Liebesverbot, The Ban on Love, which was performed in Magdeburg in 1836. Some of the operas he created had librettos which were inspired by his own love affairs in real life. He continued to compose some of the most amazing operas in history, with his last one being Parsifal, 1882. By the 20th century, opera had become popular in many countries apart from Europe. The contemporary works of the opera composers were influencing many people, but a lot of opera that was being performed were the ones that were written in the last 300 years, and not those that were being written more recently. Not that new operas were not being created at all, but the previous works of the composers were used more often for the performances. At this time, opera has reached a new level. It continues to be a sophisticated form of music, which is followed by a limited number of composers, and even the audience for opera remains limited. Opera lovers enjoy new creations as well as the old opera masterpieces. Some of the modernists of the 20th century were Arnold Schoenberg and Albin Berg. Benjamin Britten and Dmitry Shostakovich were prominent in the mid-20th century, while the most recent composers of the time are Philip Glass and John Adams. Each of them introduced their own innovative ideas in the world of operatic music as they tried to win over the hearts of the audience and make a niche for themselves in the world of opera. There have been revivals of previous works and new creations which continue to form the path for opera and the many variations created by it. Opera continues to remain a form of music which can be molded into different styles to suit different nationalities and to further new causes. And practice on the opera can vary from a few days to months, depending on the complexities of the opera that will be performed. In the course of history, opera has continuously shifted the balance that it strikes between poetry and music. What began as a seamless blending of the two, where the performers achieved a language which was between singing and speaking, gradually moved toward the favor of music and the text became less pronounced. Some historical reforms in opera tried to reinforce the balance between the two, but the manner in which opera and its creators continuously innovate to come up with performances that try to fulfill the tastes of the audiences and the changing attitudes of the patrons. At the same time, opera has also adapted to the different national preferences of the countries around the world, surviving over 400 years in the Western culture. Opera was born during the Renaissance period in Italy it was primarily a mode of royal The word opera comes from the Italian phrase opera in musica, which means work in music. It stands for a theatrical work which is made of a dramatic text, also known as a libretto. 
which has been set to music and evolves a stage that requires beautiful sceneries, flamboyant costumes, and solo as well as choral singers on the stage, who are backed by a group of instrumentalists who play offstage. It has attracted many supporters, and at the same time, opera is known to have been criticized by many people because of the costs it involves. It is considered to be an expensive form of music, which requires many people starting from the writing of the story to the enactment of the opera involving the music, singers, and the dance. The producer has to ensure that everything falls in place perfectly, could turn rather intense, and the audience was accustomed to something more light-hearted. This gave way to lavish musical entertainments, which came to be known as intermezzi, which stands for intermediate pieces. The intermezzi was acted between plays to lighten the mood and augment the spirits of the viewers with splendid effects, extravagant costumes, and a lot of singing and dancing. The audience began looking forward to these intermezzi, which seemed to be a lot more exciting than the actual plays. One of the most popular intermezzi, which has been preserved in spectacular detail, was performed at the lavish wedding at the Medici court, Florence, in the year 1589. The scenes of the intermezzi became the foundation of modern-day opera, with clouds floating across the stage, and delightful gardens, and a rocky mountain with a mermaid sitting on it. This was every bit the kind of entertainment the nobility at Florence needed. This started gaining momentum in Florence, entertainment for the kings and queens of the 16th century. Elaborate presentations were made to celebrate royal events which allowed the kings and the nobility to brag about their wealth to the royal people, as well as the foreign dignitaries. Using flamboyant costumes and spectacular effects, opera became a favorite means of alluring people to enjoy the time they spent celebrating an event. Most of the themes around which the opera was created were taken from classical mythology of the Greeks and Romans. When opera was introduced to the people, its purpose was mainly to impress the audience and to ensure that a positive image of the emperor and its people was portrayed before those who came to the royal court. What started as a form of Roman revival became opera over the next two centuries. In the 16th century, when the Renaissance period was at its peak, many Italian courts began the performance of Roman plays on festive occasions. But Roman plays and the artists began to innovate as they discovered a new form of music, which soon came to be known as opera. The transition from intermezzi to opera was not quick. It took a considerable amount of time as musicians and artists dabbled in music, trying to bring the best for their audience and ensuring that their work was entertaining enough. The soul of opera lies in the music, but it takes a beautiful form through the visuals that are used. These visuals played an equally important role to stimulate the senses of the audience so that they enjoyed the piece of music along with the sights they saw and the experience they had. While opera continues to have its soul embedded deep in the music even today, it is one of those forms of music which has never stopped low when it came to visuals. Charming dresses, enticing backgrounds, and heavenly scenes have always been a part of opera. The fact is that opera has maintained its originality in a lot of ways.